All right, so this is exam two review. This is going to be part one, and it is going to contain the information related to the pathophysiology of the nervous system. So let's go ahead and get started here. And of course, we have to start with a picture of the brain um, to give you a good understanding of just how important this organ is to us. Um, so you don't have to memorize the different parts, but as we move through and talk about some of the disease entities, uh, when we talk about Parkinson's disease, uh, some of the neurotransmitters, we know that that involves dopamine. So another neurotransmitter, we're going to talk about acetylcholine, acetylcholine as it relates to myasthenia gravis. In addition, we're going to talk about some of the structures in the brain. We've already talked about the pituitary gland when we talked about fluid and electrolytes, um, particularly uh, antidiuretic hormone. We're going to talk about the temporal lobe and the thalamus when we get to schizophrenia a little bit later in this lecture. But to really appreciate the brain, you have to realize that it is very finicky. It has to be in that perfect 7.35 to 7.45 pH, it accounts for and uses about 20% of the oxygen um, taken into the body. So also it runs on pure glucose. So very finicky, but when those um, components, the oxygen, the pH, uh, glucose, if that's not provided in the amounts that it's needed to function properly, what we see in our patients is some sort of pathophysiology. Um, and mostly we see the very first indication that something's going on is with level of consciousness. Um, think about yourself when you're doing a 12-hour shift. Like I say, it's usually a 14-hour shift. But anyway, about after eight hours, you haven't eaten. How do you feel? You feel very irritable. And that is a reflection of that brain not getting that needed glucose to run um, in good functioning order. So let's go ahead and move on to differentiating between the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system, which is of course the uh, that makes up the autonomic nervous system. So when you think about the parasympathetic nervous system, you gotta think about it's kind of slow and it is the day-to-day -day needs of the body. Um, it doesn't react to crises. Um, it likes status quo, maintenance, homeostasis, right? Now, let's go to that sympathetic nervous system. This is that adrenaline rush that you hear people talk about. Very important when it comes to that fight or flight. So what it does is it kind of responds and prepares the body for defense. Um, so catecholamines are released, in particular epinephrine. It's a neurotransmitter, um, but it mobilizes energy stores because those muscles, your lungs, need that extra energy so that you can run away from uh, a bear, whatever. I don't know where I got that at, but anyway, so to run away from something that is threatening you. Um, and so it mobilizes energy. And when you think about the four hormones, and we'll get more into hormones, of course, when we hit endocrine, but there's four hormones that in, increases that glucose and energy for the body. It's the catecholamines, of course, glucagon, growth hormone, um, and cortisol. Uh, so thinking about that, those four hormones can compared to one hormone called insulin, and that's going to be decreased. It's not going to be eliminated, but it's going to be decreased because it's we still need that insulin to get that energy glucose into the cells. But the other interesting about other interesting thing about epinephrine and that sympathetic nervous system is it will redistribute blood flow. So it takes the blood flow away from the gut, the GI system, because who cares about food at that point? And it also takes it away from the skin or the integumentary system, reshunts it into muscles, lungs, so that we can run away from any kind of threat. The next we're going to talk about is primary brain injury. 
Um, and we can classify that into either focal or diffuse. When we think about focal, we're thinking about a precise location, such as an epidural hemorrhage, a subdural hemorrhage. So these are an example of a primary insult, right? And you can see over there with that little picture, that little blackened area, you can see where that brain's been infarcted. There's also things called diffuse injuries, once again, primary, in that hypoxia. We talked about hypoxia um, in exam one, but that is a diffuse, that lack of oxygen to the brain. Meningitis, encephalitis. So those are some more of what we call diffuse versus just a very precise location. But here we go into the secondary injury. The secondary injury is what we refer to as that swelling or that cerebral edema that can occur after these injuries. Well, you know the brain is in a vault and that brain has not much room to grow. And so what it causes is it causes um, pressure on other structures, intracranial pressure. So it'll cause that pressure on other structures, hindering the other structure's ability to function properly. A good example of this is when we talked about diabetes insipidus related to the lack of secretion of antidiuretic hormone. And so what you'll see is these patients will um, have an output of six to eight liters in a day. That's why we watch that urinary output so carefully with this patient population. So next we're gonna talk about autonomic hyperreflexia or dysreflexia, it's the same thing. But what happens here is it's a massive reflexive sympathetic discharge. So what does that mean? In other words, the sympathetic nervous system above that T5 or T6 level, there's no inhibition. And so what you end up seeing is this imbalance between that sympathetic nervous system above that T5 and T6 and the parasympathetic system isn't able to help out. So there's an imbalance there. So what you end up seeing is these clinical manifestations. They have a proxismal hypertension of up to 300 millimeters of mercury systolic. You'll, they'll of course have that pounding headache and a blurred vision. The thing that can trigger this is simply a full bladder or um, they can't uh, evacuate their bowels. So that is two very simple triggers that can cause this autonomic hyperreflexia. In addition, they're sweating above the level of that lesion and they become very flushed above that lesion. So the spinal cord injury results in a disturbed thermal control, hypothalamus, and it's un unable to do their, that job of regulating that body heat. In addition, you see that reflexive bradycardia. So they can go down to 30 to 40 beats per minute. And that's because there's that stimulation of that carotid sinus to the vagus nerve, to that SA node. And so you see that reflexive bradycardia. So next is difference between delirium and dementia. So of course, our population is aging. And so big, big difference between delirium and dementia is that delirium is acute. So it can be hours to weeks versus dementia is something that is, is slow to progress. It can be months to years. Um, now, some of the clinical manifestations do present themselves the same. Uh, there can be delusions. There can be um, hallucinations hallucinations, except for with dementia, usually intact early. It's later on that that might occur. So you can see that usually a major cause when we have a, a older adult come in with a caregiver, the caregiver will say, uh, you know, they started getting real confused. You know, we don't know what's going on. You know, one of the first things as a provider you really want to think about is simply a urinary tract infection. So order that urinalysis, you see white blood cells. So it could be as simple as a urinary tract infection that can show those signs of delirium. The thing about dementia, and we're going to talk about this with Alzheimer's, is it's really um, being a provider is, is it's that um, process of elimination. All right, so let's move on here to a certain kind of dementia called Alzheimer's. The good thing, if there is anything good about Alzheimer's, is 90% of those that present with these signs and symptoms, it's late onset. 
Late onset Alzheimer's is much slower to progress. The other 10% is that early onset and that prognosis is not good because it progresses very quickly. But let's talk about um, it being one of the leading causes in um, as a cause of dementia. But once again, Alzheimer's, it's not really sure what exact the cause is, but we do know a definitive diagnosis is post-mortem. It is, once again, that process of elimination. So you're gonna check to make sure, do they have a urinary tract infection? Hey, is there a brain tumor? I mean, so there's different things that you can do to begin to eliminate, is this the cause? But you also have to do a good health history because we know the risk factors are things like smoking, we know that diabetes, we know that hypertension, some of those core morbidities can increase the risk of Alzheimer's. Next is stroke. So stroke, um, the incidence of stroke is about two times more prevalent in the black uh, community versus the white. It does run in families, but we know that the ischemic, ischemic uh, stroke is the most common. Um, in addition, the most common area for a stroke that we see is in the MCA. That stands for the middle cerebral artery. And if you know a little bit about the anatomy of the brain, we also know that those clinical manifestations are going to present themselves as dysphagias. Dysphagias is that inability to comprehend or speak. So that's a good sign that it is that MCA. But let's go into some of the risk factors. Uncontrolled hypertension, that is the single greatest risk factor for stroke. So when you become a provider, you've got to keep those patients adherent to that medication to control that hypertension. Some of these other long lists all kind of work together. When you look at obesity, you know that obesity is also related to physical inactivity. You know that their diet is not optimal. In other words, they're not eating good choices such as fresh fruits and vegetables. Atrial fibrillation, we're gonna come back to atrial fibrillation when we get into the cardiac system and we'll get more in depth on that. But also chronic sleep deprivation. We're gonna talk about sleep deprivation here in just a minute as well. So Guillain-Barre, and yes, I'm pronouncing that correct, it's French, and so the L is silent. So Guillain-Barre syndrome, think about it, uh, it is an autoimmune disease, but it is triggered by a bacterial or viral infection. Something that's been around now for a couple years that's extremely scary is something called the Zika virus. So the CDC is taking great measures to track the Zika virus and how it's impacting and causing other comorbidities. But Gu Guillain-Barre has been associated now with that um, virus. But what ends up happening is weakness usually plateaus or improves by about the fourth week. The problem with this is it's on a continuum. Some it may just be simple weakness, Others go into full respiratory distress and end up on mechanical ventilation. And in fact, 10 to 30% of individuals end up on a respirator. Um, I've cared for patients, one patient in particular, I'll, I'll always remember her um, because it was my first uh, case of Guillain-Barre that I cared for. And she ended up on mechanical ventilation and it took her almost a month uh, to um, be weaned from that mechanical mechanical ventilation, and then about a six to a one year course of rehabilitation to get back to normal. Also the cranial nerves, which you do not have to memorize, um, but the cranial nerves, um, it also affects those through chewing, swallowing, and coughing, all those protective mechanisms. So the next we're gonna talk about multiple sclerosis. The difference here is it's not triggered by an infection. It is a chronic inflammatory disease which we're gonna talk about inflammation in part two of this um, review for exam two. But right now know that it is a chronic inflammatory disease and it involves the degeneration of the central nervous system myelin. 
So the central nervous system myelin. So what does myelin do? Well, myelin is actually an electrical insulator. I think that's a great way to describe it. And what it does is it increases the velocity or the speed of impulse transmission. And so you can see down here on this picture where it's all kind of chewed up, that scarring. Um, there's places where there's actually formation of plaque and loss of axons. And so now those clinical manifestations, how they present themselves is because of that demyelination of that myelin sheath. And so what they're going to have is they're going to present with difficulty walking. Um, they're not going to have that muscle function that they need. But here's the thing, 90% all have what's called remitting or relapsing course. In other words, remissions and exacerbations. So they can go for quite some time without any signs or symptoms or minimal signs or symptoms. Then some stressor will push them into an exacerbation. One thing that we know is, for example, in women, sometimes the first stressor that a woman goes under is pregnancy. So they may have their first episode and we don't think of pregnancy as a stressor, but it really is a stressor on the body. And so sometimes that's the first time that they've ever had any signs or symptoms of that disease. The next is myasthenia gravis. So myasthenia gravis is related to acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a very important neurotransmitter. And so acetylcholine, when it connects to the receptor, it allows for muscles to contract. But what happens with myasthenia gravis, as you can see down here in the corner, you can see that an antibody attacks that receptor. And so the acetylcholine can't get, it's blocked, and so that muscle cannot contract. So what they present with is this exertional fatigue and weakness. Now, they'll say, well, it does improve with rest, but it continues, it's, um, it, it, there's no cure. And so pretty soon things become worse and worse. It becomes to, it, it progresses. And when you can tell, when they get to some of those final stages is it really affects the respiratory muscles. And so sometimes they may need a respirator. Um, also, they have many, many episodes of aspirations, aspiration because they're choking and unable to control that swallowing mechanism. But earlier in the course, so that's the end. So they're usually gonna come in once again, that fatigue, um, that weakness, also, you may see ptosis, where that one eye, you can see how it kind of is droopy. So some of those are some of the early signs. So next, we're going to talk about Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, um, the primary pathology, once again, it's still really the primary cause is still unknown. But we know the pathology is the degeneration of the basal ganglia. The basal ganglia is made up of the corpus striatum, the globus pallidus, and of course the sub substantia nigra. You really don't need to know that, but you do need to know that it's the basal ganglia that's involved. So what happens at the basal ganglia is the loss of dopamine. With that loss of dopamine, you're going to see these presenting symptoms. They're going to have resting tremors huge bradykinesia, in other words, that rigidity and poverty of movement. You can tell if you're at the mall or whatever, we're nurses, we watch people, it's our job. It's not that we're people watchers, it's just we, we can't help ourselves. And so you can see someone, you can just, you can tell by that shuffling gait, you'll see that their arms, they don't swing like they should. Instead, they're pretty well held stiffly at their side. And so in your pharmacology class, you're going to get into some of those medications that can help with this disease entity and hopefully slow the progression. But remember, later on in the disease, they begin to hallucinate and it's quite a devastating disease for those people um, as well as the caregivers. So let's talk about comparison of acute versus chronic pain. Um, acute pain is very straightforward. It's um, usually a sudden event. Uh, the duration is less than that six months. Usually at six months, if it's past that, we start thinking about a chronic problem. 
Um, but And there's also clinical signs. Usually we see an increased pulse rate, elevated blood pressure, that kind of thing. With chronic pain, very, very different. You don't see that those clinical manifestations. But let's talk about a certain kind of chronic pain, probably the most common and ones that you're going to probably see in your practice. And that is neuropathic pain. It is chronic pain. It's initiated caused by a primary lesion or dysfunction of that nervous system. The interesting thing is that it's, it's pain, it's amplification of pain. So let's say um, they're complaining of burning, shooting, shock-like, or tingling in their feet. A lot of times we see this with diabetic patients. And yet you look at their feet and they look fine. You don't see any lesions or anything. So it's amplified, uh, but very real. Um, and so this is a very common type of chronic pain. The thing about pain, acute pain, it is protective. It's a great thing when you look at it that way. But chronic pain, uh, we know that this is a, a huge um, challenge as a provider to try and control that pain and increase that patient's ability to have physical activity, even if, you're, if their feet are shooting and burning and pain. I mean, how are they supposed to keep up that physical activity? That's so important. Okay, next, headaches. So there's three categories here. It's once again, some of the symptoms to rule out some of the causes. Um, remember that headaches can also uh, be a sign of maybe a brain tumor, could be meningitis. So it's once again, that whole idea of um, that process of elimination. But migraine headaches, even up to 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, um, it was all in their head right? Well, it is, but there's been a lot of research on it and found that there really is a physiological cause. One of those causes, of course, that massive vasodilation. In addition, there's an inflammatory response that goes along with the migraine, so they are very, very real. Most of the time, they affect females. Um, they do have a family history involved. They usually have associated features. Some of those associated features is vomiting, prior to the onset of the migraine headache. In addition, they're photophobic. They like to be in a dark room. The second kind is cluster headaches. This is more male, uh, affects males much more than females, and they cluster at times. So they come on somewhat rapidly, and then they'll go into remission, and the patient doesn't complain of it. This is also associated with lacrimation. Lacrimation, all that is, is tearing of the eyes, rhinorrhea, that's a fancy way of saying like a runny nose, but it can be very, very painful. And there is medications that these patients can take. And then of course, the last is tension. And of course, probably many of you experiencing tension headaches. Um, patho, maybe you're taking farm as well. You've got life, you've got jobs, everything else. Please take care of yourselves. Take that extra hour, go for a walk, relax. Um, do what you can to try and keep that stress under control. In part two, we're going to literally focus on stress. But right now, so make sure you're taking care of yourself. But these are um, usually very transient, depending on stress levels, what's going on in your life. Usually ibuprofen um, is probably sufficient and maybe a little bit of rest. Next is sleep deprivation. So I promised you we're going to come back to sleep deprivation. Serious disturbances of the sleep-wake cycle are observed in many people under stress, certainly in our patients in the hospitals in that acute care setting. So we have to try and cluster our care so that those patients are getting that good rest. Also, if you've ever worked night shift, most of us have. Um, and we also know that we have to be very diligent in caring for ourselves with good nutrition and getting the rest we need because what ends up happening is look at this, at this, um, all the effects of excessive cortisol because with sleep deprivation, circadian rhythm is disrupted. So that means cortisol is being released when it shouldn't. And also over time, that excess, um, uh, that excess secretion of that cortisol starts giving us problems. Some of those problems are increased blood pressure. We start having increased glucose. 
all right so um glycemic index is off we start having increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines we're going to talk about cytokines in and all by themselves when we get into part two but pro-inflammatory that in itself tells you that we are much more prone to inflammation episodes infection also those natural killer cell activities that helps us with our immune system that's being disrupted and so you can see all these different causes of problems just related to not having that ability to sleep having good sleep another um, disease entity we really want to talk about is something called obstructive sleep apnea syndrome this is very important because it is the most common um, cause of sleep disorders. Why we're so concerned about this, and as providers, you're probably going to order CPAP for your patients, whatever. Um, but anyway, what we're concerned about is that associated reduced blood oxygen saturation because they're not breathing. And so when you think about the population, it's that older population. That older population has other comorbidities. And when we think about heart, right that heart it needs that oxygen and so if they're not breathing correctly they don't have CPAP whatever what ends up happening is it could um, cause a cardiac event next is vision so the one we're really going to focus on because it's the most common is that open angle glaucoma it is the most common we know that there is a family history of this um, and that it can be inherited but it is the leading cause of visual impairment and blindness so this little picture right here i think does a really beautiful job open drainage angle no problem there but then as the fluid goes down there's a clogged drainage hole and that's that's real medical terminology for you, but I think it really captures what's going on. Well, when that fluid backs up in the eye, it increases that interocular pressure. Pressure's not good because it causes the death of that optic nerve and causes that de degeneration of that nerve. And one of the first signs is that loss of peripheral vision. So that loss of peripheral vision, it's not going to end there if treatment is not um doesn't happen then it ends up going into central visual impairment and sooner or later blindness that's why at the driver stations have you ever noticed when they test people's vision they they do test peripheral vision and that's one of the reasons and it might be the first sign that someone needs to go and get um their vision checked next we're going to talk about hearing loss so hearing loss conductive hearing loss think about something blocking that ear canal probably um, the most common. So an older adult comes in, you get your otoscope, you check the insides of that ear. And you might find, uh, see this ugly little um, dried cerumen or earwax inside that ear. I know what you're thinking, you just wanna pick that out, don't you? But anyway, something is blocking that. So you can remove that and hopefully it will restore their hearing. Um, but impacted cerumen, foreign bodies, so those little people, uh, they like to stick peas in their ears. Um, it could be tumors. So you wanna get in there and certainly look. So certainly the symptoms are that diminished hearing um, and soft speaking voice. But let's go to the other kind that's sensor, sensory neuro hearing loss. This is a little bit trickier. This has probably been years of maybe someone working in a very noisy environment, maybe our construction workers, um, because remember OSHA wasn't always around or that protective gear that is required nowadays. So if you have an 80 year old patient and they've been in the construction in, in, in industry for a while, they've not had that luxury of having those earphones. So the damage is done. There's other causes such as um, autotoxicity. We know Lasix, furosemide causes autotoxicity. Sometimes there's nothing we can do about that, but we need to make sure that we're monitoring that. Um, some of the other ones, of course, diabetes uh, can cause sensorial hearing loss. Now, presbycusis is just a fancy way of saying age-related hearing loss, um, and it's the most common form is sensorial neural hearing loss. So that's just a fancy way of saying uh, hearing loss for the elderly. 
Okay, so that is the hearing loss. Now let's go into the neurobiology of schizophrenia. So with the neurobiology of schizophrenia, we do know what is found is that there is an enlargement. So imaging techniques, there will be an enlargement of the lateral and third ventricles. Okay, very interesting. The other thing that you could see is that there is a reduction in the thalamus and temporal lobe areas. Now, when you look over here at these symptoms, it's going to kind of make sense what parts of the brain are now affected with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, we know that they hear external voices right, in the form of auditory hallucinations. And this makes sense because that misrepresentation of speech in that auditory cortex within that temporal lobe, right, temporal lobe, speech, right, um, and other sensory, but we think about speech, particularly in that temporal lobe. So what ends up happening is they hear these auditory hallucinations. Something else very interesting about um, schizophrenia and something that you should probably know, is um, increased concentration of dopamine, a neurotransmitter. We talked about a decrease in dopamine with Parkinson's and what those clinical manifestations were, but now this is an increased concentration of dopamine. Absolutely fascinating. And so now with that increase in that dopamine, they're going to have that increased motor activity, but also that impulsive behavior that is characteristic as well of a patient suffering from schizophrenia. So you can see the positive symptoms, the delusion, the hallucinations, the negative symptoms, some of those, and of course that disorganized symptoms such as that disorganized speech, there you go, there's that temporal lobe again, disorganized behavior, there you go, that's that increased in dopamine. And so you can kind of connect those clinical manifestations with what areas of the brain and that pathophysiology that's going on in that patient with schizophrenia. And lastly, we're going to talk a little about the mood disorders. So mood disorders we're finding as uh, one of the most common mood disorders is that unilad unipolar or major depressive disorder. So when we think about this, um, we know that it's across the entire lifespan. We know children can suffer from unipolar depression. Kind of scary. So, um, what are the symptoms? This isn't just you're having a bad day. This is over time. Um, this is that feeling of loss of pleasure. Uh, changes in sleep, and we already know what happens with sleep deprivation. Appetite or weight gain, something like that. They could lose weight, they can gain weight. But the big thing is suicide. And so that's why um, we need to be very aware. And in most practices now, um, uh, the first thing, one of the first things that's asked is, you know, um, uh, do you feel depressed? That's a really good thing to start out um, to determine and assess whether or not that patient is just having you know, having a bad day, or do they have a major depressive disorder? So this is not to be confused with bipolar disorder. Bipolar disorder, there's two types. There's bipolar one disorder, and this is where they have a manic episode that's preceded or followed by a major depressive episode, and then bipolar two disorder. That is where it's more major depressive episodes um, that last usually about two weeks. And um, so just kind of differentiate between those two. But we're really focusing on that unipolar or major depressive disorder because it is so common and um, is, I think it's number two for disabilities in the United States. So thank you very much. Have a great day. And part two that we'll be focusing on inflammation, infection, and cancer. And of course, we're gonna dive a little bit further into stress. Uh, will be forthcoming. Thank you.